Whoever is listening, guys, welcome back. My name is Grayson Mann. This is the Name of the Plan podcast, episode 89. We're getting close to 90, and I don't know what I'm going to do for it, but I imagine we'll do something special. We'll continue to cover the NBA Finals. Today, we're going to do two things. We're going to talk about games one and two, kind of cover what has happened, kind of the whole thing. It's been an interesting series thus far. I did, I did correctly predict this, so so far I'm right. So we'll see how it goes moving forward. I still have the Warriors in seven. My mind has not changed on that, but I'm right so far. So I'm really like, really curious. <laughs> it's been a super physical series. It's been a lot of surprises. And at the same time, got what I expected in game two. So really, really interesting stuff. So we're going to cut into two segments for my YouTube audience. We're going to have the first segment be about the NBA finals. Games one and two will be covered. What I thought. Then we're going to talk about the French Open champion, Rafael Nadal, and why Grand Slam 22 was his most important. So we're going to talk about that. Cannot wait. Let's start with the the finals. Man, what a series. Let's get into it. Really, sometimes when you go into something, you have these set of expectations. And it's really weird because I thought I knew how this series was going to go, and it kind of flipped in a weird way. So... Everyone has expectations, and you've seen the memes before of expectations versus reality and how you think one thing is going to go a certain way, and it ends up flipping. So the script, how I thought, I I predicted it, but in my mind, I don't know if I truly believed it. I thought game one was Golden State's to win. I didn't think the Celtics had any business. I thought I'd be bold and predict it on the show a couple days ago with the last episode we posted but I, I really did think, especially going into the first couple minutes of the first quarter, I was thinking, okay, Boston's looking a little unsettled. They're in it, but there, there was a lot of miscommunication on defense. They were letting Curry shoot with a ton of space. And I just thought that the moment everyone was talking about it, the experience, the moment, it was going to take about a game for them to settle in and kind of get used to the ebbs and flows of the finals, the bright lights, Draymond in your face, Steph Curry shooting out of his mind. They had, a, they had a bad Tatum game, too. So if you told me Curry was going to start 21 points in the first quarter, he was going to go absolutely nuclear, and Tatum was going to go three for 17 from the field, you would have told me Golden State would have won by at least double digits, right? No. <laughs> and after a paymaker of a third quarter where Golden State dominated the Celtics, Boston came out in the fourth quarter and absolutely crushed Golden State. They couldn't miss a shot. Derek White, Al Horford, Marcus Smart, Jalen Brown, we're all making super significant contributions. It was crazy. I couldn't believe it. I predicted the Celtics to win game one, but like I said just a couple seconds ago, I don't don't think my heart was fully in it. It might have been a little bit of a fan thing, going like, man, it'd be great if we could steal one on the road. I did think that I was like, okay, if Boston's not going to survive this, the game two, they're going to come out with desperation. They haven't lost in the postseason yet, and neither has Golden State. And so in a way, it kind of flipped. Because usually you expect Golden State to shoot out of their minds in the fourth quarter to close it out. In the finals, they've been there, done that. You expect Boston to be super physical and set the tone. So it flipped. Game one, Boston shot out of their minds. Their role players, their guys came to play. It was like they've been there a million times before. And a big critique of the Celtics has been their fourth quarter. They get a little tight. Maybe they don't believe in themselves as much. And they came out and they were on fire. They were shooting out of their minds. It was crazy. In game two, I had a feeling right in the beginning, Al Horford had the ball at the top of the key, and Draymond just spiked it from him. It was a jump ball. But I was like, man, that's a tone setter. And let's talk about what Draymond Green means for Golden State for a second. Now, while I don't necessarily agree, well, <laughs> I don't necessarily agree with everything that happened on the court. I thought there were a couple of missed calls here and there. I thought Draymond kind of got free liberty after that technical, but he did exactly what he should have done. If he's under, if he has an understanding that the NBA refs aren't going to want to throw him out, he gets to kind of be Draymond. This is who he's been. This is who he is. I love what he does with this podcast. I think he's well-spoken and I think he's super intelligent on the court. Get some people's faces. This is a young Boston Celtics team. Why wouldn't Draymond Green want to get in Jalen Brown's head? After Jalen Brown's pants apparently were trying to be pulled off, he went cold. Grant Williams, again, another no-show from him with Draymond Green all night, got tackled practically at one point on the court, getting in Al Horford's face, getting in Jason Tatum's face. Tatum had a nice game, 
but it still was those classic Celtics games where they've turned it over and it's in the double digits. Golden State had 23 points off of turnovers. That ended up being the deciding factor for me mostly. Now, this is super important. Boston came, they got what they came for. They got home court advantage now. The rest of the games, the majority of these games will be played in Boston games three, four, why well, I went like this <laughs> for my YouTube audience. I messed up my number count with my fingers. So that's, but Boston has games three, they have games four, and they have game six at home. Whereas Golden State will now have five and seven. That is the format as which the NBA has chosen to do, but it was important. So part of me, I don't like to use this as a point for the show, but part of me was thinking, did Boston say, hey, we got what we came for. Let's just wrap it up. Let's let's take Tatum and them out. Let's make sure we can get our guys healthy. Robert Williams consistently limping all over the court. It kind of felt like he was out of the game. He's really been taken out. His impact has not been as significant as I thought it would be. And I think that's a credit to Golden State being able to prevent, say, hey, we're not going to make Robert Williams beat us. We're not going to let Jason Tatum beat us. We're going to let these guys beat us. Draymond, in a way, was correct. He said, we'll be fine, pointing out Marcus Smart, Derek White, Al Horford, shooting the way they did. I don't think that that is the expectation moving forward. I think there's a medium, there's a balance to be found with that. But we'll see. Game three is going to be super important. Does Golden State take back that home court advantage? Or does Boston take game three and four? and kind of figure things out from there. For Boston, it's win your home games and you're an NBA champion. For Golden State, the pressure is still on them because they are going to have to win on the road. They're going to be, have to be able to be successful. The Garden, I imagine, will be nuts, and it's Boston for crying out loud, especially with this new added headline with Draymond Green. There should be some really fun interactions. Hopefully, everybody keeps it to a level. Well, there's a line in the sand. Let's not cross it, but excited. Will Draymond Green get ejected from this NBA Finals? I don't know. Uh, where I stand on my prediction with the series, I still think Golden State's going to win in seven. They just feel like at certain points they're in control, and it feels kind of all over the place for Boston sometimes. And I think there's probably one or two more games where they're careless and sloppy with the basketball. So I still think Golden State's got this series. I think Boston, that's part of being a young team. It's kind of getting to this point and figuring out who you are, figuring out how and what it takes to get there. So I still have Golden State in seven. That has not changed. I do think Golden State's done a lot of good things, match that physicality. They're shooting as well. Clay Thompson is not playing really well at all, and they're still tied 1-1. They're keeping them for rhythm, but we don't play till Wednesday. I'm recording this Monday night, so there's still two days left before we see an NBA Finals game again, which is weird. This new schedule has been kind of – weird but i think it's more or less for the tv deals and for injuries so it is what it is but yeah so i still have warriors in seven excited to see how this series plays out especially as a Celtics fan i got my hat right here try to keep it neutral on this show as always uh shout out to the shirt that i'm wearing today <laughs> but uh guys that's my thoughts on the nba finals i'm gonna take a short break and when i get back i'm going to tell you why title number 22, Grand Slam title number 22 for Rafael Nadal was his most significant. All right, see you guys soon. I think sometimes in sports, we find that one athlete who it almost becomes like a story and it's famously documented. The more the media gets immersed into sports, the more we find out about these guys playing through unbelievable injuries, playing through stuff we couldn't even fathom or imagine. I, I, step on a Lego and I'm done for the day, or you bust your toe on a din dining room table and you're done for the day. So it gives you perspective. And I know that stepping on a Lego sounds hilarious, but it gives you perspective. You have athletes like Clay Thompson shooting two free throws in the NBA finals after tearing his ACL Tiger Woods playing through an unbelievable injury, ACL and leg and the 2008 U S open Ronnie Lott, a famous safety for the 49ers, getting his finger crushed and amputated and going back into the game. Phillip Rivers playing through a torn ACL against the Patriots in the playoffs. Uh, you have recent examples, Joel Embiid playing through an orbital fracture, Marcus Smart and Jason Tatum going through certain injuries in game three against the Miami Heat, stuff like that we can't get enough of. And it's those kinds of stories that inspire. You go on like the flu game with Michael Jordan, it's famously documented in a Netflix series. And we ended up finding out it was food poisoning. But 
the way Michael Jordan carried himself is there's no way he can get me off, keep me off the field. There's no way he can keep me off the court. I have to do this type thing. And I, that's what I think makes this specific grand slam title for an adult special. And this is very rare for this podcast to be talking about tennis. But if you don't know, I played tennis for nine years and I love it. I love watching the grand slams. I love watching the U.S. Open, Wimbledon, love watching the Roland Garros. I love watching it all. It's so much fun. I have so many fond memories sitting on the couch during the summertime watching Wimbledon with my brother. So I got a chance to watch Nadal, fought an incredible semifinal, fought Djokovic in the quarterfinal, and then played a great match against Rude in the final. Overcame, a, it was straight sets. It was a phenomenal match by Nadal. The King of Clay gets his 14th Grand Slam title in the French Open alone. That's just 14 in one single tournament. He has 22 overall. And then when Djokovic won Wimbledon, it was 20, 20, and 20. So the big three, as we have declared it, there's who is going to get that separation. And I, I don't think many believe Nadal had it left in the tank. He's 36. He's the oldest champion in the French Open history. And I think I don't know if he's the oldest in Grand Slam history, but I have some tennis guys that'll obviously uh, keep me up to date on that for sure. But I wanted to talk about, and it really inspired me in a way. So when Nadal was going through this entire tournament, and he's been going through for a while, is this chronic foot pain and this, this big nerve injury, from what I've read, that he has to get constant injections into his foot to just numb it, to just keep the pain out. It is unbearable in that way. So you have to be able to basically play through an entire tennis match that requires such precise footwork, such precise movement for each shot, and you don't really feel it. So the amount of focus that it takes to be able to kind of get that together and that muscle memory, it's really impressive that I was able to not only take it through straight sets, but be able to deal with that kind of weird, odd sensation at such a high level. These are serious players. These are the best players in the world. He took down arguably the best player in the world in the quarterfinal with Djokovic. And here's why I think it's so important for Nadal. That separation, he is halfway to a calendar Grand Slam, and we do not know if he's going to be able to do it. It's unfortunate. He said in his press conference that his future is uncertain, but he's going to find out. I think he's going to a specialist soon to determine what's the next step for him. But it's been a chronic thing for him. It's insane. And why I think it's the most important and why I think it separates him is because it tells a story. And at his age, too, a lot of people are going to be talking about in 10 years when they stack up everybody, they stack up Djokovic's career, who he could go for a long, much longer time. But they're going to look at this. And while Federer's injured, he's been dealing with knee injury. While Djokovic has had the situation with the Australian Open, and he just lost to Nadal in the French Open quarterfinal, there is going to be that conversation. Uh, well, hey, which tournament, which title sounds the most fascinating? What tells the coolest, what tells the brightest story? What inspires that next tennis player? Well, Nadal played through chronic foot pain, got injections constantly, and won the French Open at 36. Those kind of stories. Now, it's, it's not football. It's not basketball. So does it get a Netflix documentary? I don't know. There's a serious tennis audience. But you don't, you're not going to see Netflix going to make the last dance for Nadal. But in a way, it probably was. And for that kind of send-off, that potential bowing out, playing through that unbelievable pain, playing through that numbness, playing through that odd sensation, that is lined up there. Flu game, torn ACL, broken leg, that kind of stuff. It's a whole nerve that you're shutting down, that you're having to be able to go through. It's incredible. And it's an inspiring story. Why I'm doing this now is because it was that impressive. I was reading about it for hours last night. And I was like, man, I got to talk about it. And when we look back on it, when the, uh, the tennis analysts and when we talk about legacy, that's important. Fighting through that kind of injury. He could have retired in the first round. He could have bowed on and said, this is not my tournament. Let's, let's rally for Wimbledon. Let's hope for that. This was his spot. The king of clay overcoming his own battle on a court where he's been most dominant his entire career, 14 and 0 great. I think his record in the entire tournament of the French open is 114 and three. And he wouldn't let the foot injury take him down. I don't know if this is going to get super corny, but I think it's awesome. 
that you're able to kind of go through that and that kind of battle. So that's to any athlete, really, is that your heroes can make it through this, so you can too, type stuff. And it's important. Like I said earlier, when they start stacking up these legacies, they're going to look to this title and they're going to go, what did Nadal have to overcome? What did Djokovic have to overcome in this tournament? Did he have an easy draw? What did Nadal have to overcome in his 22nd Grand Slam? Oh, we had to overcome one of the best players in the world, one of the rising stars in Rude, Zavra. I totally botched that pronunciation, but uh, he had to overcome that. He had to overcome a lot of things. A three-hour match with Zavra, and he ended up going down, but uh, he had to overcome a lot personally and through players, which is why it's so important. So I think in the grand scheme of things, it tells a story. It marks a chapter in Nadal's legacy that shows he was willing to overcome a lot at such a very just, it, it almost feels like at the pinnacle, the very end of this career. We don't know if it's the end, but it very well could be. And that's what makes it important. And that's what makes it a story. So guys, sorry for the corniness or cheesiness. That might've been like a trailer type thing. Like this summer, Nadal overcomes injuries to yada yada but you know you know what i mean and I, I really love tennis and it's really something that i love talking about so if you want more of that content subscribe below and comment and let me know obviously we're on apple Podcasts, spotify youtube or wherever you get your podcast subscribe or leave me a five-star review i've got a bunch of stuff planned thank you as always this is just stuff i love to try out especially in this time of sports when there's not much to talk about so we can kind of branch out thank you guys as always have a great day and take care 